Good morning, good morning. Welcome to our Wednesday Bible study. Uh, this series we're in right now is examining the life of Paul, how he went from persecutor to apostle, the process involved in his transformation. Now, at the end of our last lesson, we saw two maps showing the routes that Paul took on his first and second missionary journey. He covered a lot of area and estimate scholars estimate that in all Paul traveled over 10,000 miles in his lifetime preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, it's almost uncomprehensible. Over 10,000 miles in three missionary journeys. Trial after trial met him. Most of them came from Jews who did not believe the gospel. And not only that, they sought to prevent others from believing it too. We see that with the help of the Holy Ghost, they failed. Picking up on in Acts chapter 19, beginning at verse one, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. Now, Apollos is in Corinth, and he learns the way of the Lord more perfectly. Paul leaves Antioch and is now in Ephesus where he is greeted by the brethren. He promised to return to sea. Once more, he encounters disciples with incomplete knowledge of the doctrine. Convinced they did not have the proper understanding, they were baptized into Christ. Now, there's no indication that they were Christians being rebaptized. Scripture does not give us a reason to be rebaptized. Baptized, And I've heard a number of people over the years saying, well, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing when I came. So I want to be baptized again. Or I was I was too young to really comprehend. I want to be baptized again. There's nothing in scripture that gives us an example of a member of the body of Christ being baptized again. Now, here we see Paul impart the miraculous power of the Holy Ghost by laying on of hands. Uh, now these miracles were necessary in the early church, remember, because they did not have the complete written word of God. And these miracles were to confirm the teaching that it did in fact come from God. They could now preach and teach to those of different tongues or languages, the wonderful word of God. These two episodes show that the encouraging of the churches already planted was crucial. Acts chapter 19, verse 8. 
And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And he continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Okay, these vagabond or strolling or traveling Jews, went about using charms and spells to perform wonders among the people. They were traveling exorcists, if you will. They didn't know the difference between their false wonders and the genuine ones performed by Paul. Now their fraud was revealed by the evil spirit possessing this one man. Some believe that they thought they were working with Paul, but Thinking you're right and being right are two different things. This is why we study. When the word was spread of this incident, the Bible says fear fell on them all and many believed. And the name of Jesus was magnified. That was the desired result of the work of the Holy Ghost. Now, in Paul's preaching, those in Ephesus were so convicted that they brought their books of charms and spells and burned them publicly. It's estimated that the price of the books that were burned totaled over $10,000. Now this showed the commitment to the Ephesians, to the gospel of Christ. When you get rid of those things that keep you apart from Christ and publicly burn them, if you will, then that shows you are really committed to the cause of Christ. Verse 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a season. At the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver strides for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that none, not, at, not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, 
but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these things, sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring that he should not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not whereof they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning their other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. Listen to the voice of reason. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. All right. Chaos in Ephesus. The Ephesians are believing the gospel and turning to Jesus as Lord. They're burning their books and denouncing Diana as a goddess. They no longer believe that the things made with hands are gods. This angers Demetrius and the craftsmen which made their living selling religious artifacts. Stirring the people into a frenzy, they grabbed Gaius and Aristarchus and rushed them into a theater. Paul's friends, seeing how stirred up the mob was, held him back and would not let him enter. It's interesting that the scripture reveals that many of the crowd didn't even know why they were there. Verse 32, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. And the more part, most of them, knew not wherefore they were come together. Somebody saw a crowd and said, let's go see what's going on. How sad it is when emotion trumps intelligence and people do things ignorantly because they've been stirred up by someone else. The Bible says there was a two hour chant of great is Diana of the Ephesians. But after that, cooler heads prevail. I just want to talk a little bit about that. You know, just because someone says something is true, doesn't make it true. So they said, great is Diana of the Ephesians. She's not great. They said it loud. You can be wrong loud, but cooler heads prevail. The town clerk calmed them down and the assembly was dismissed. He warned them that they would be called in question for their actions that day because these were not wicked men. They were neither robbers of churches nor blasphemers. Paul preached the positive truth of the gospel without being belittling or demeaning. This did not go unnoticed. 
they chanted this for two hours. And even if you yield a bit to hyperbole, let's just say a half hour. Can you imagine a, the same chant over and over and over? How committed were these people? How, how brainwashed they were that they would not even entertain the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm afraid that there are many in this world today who will not even entertain the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's not a new occurrence. So we need to seek those who are interested. Acts chapter 20, verse one. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia and there accompanied him into Asia, Sopatar of Berea and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. These, going before, tarried for us at Troas, and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. All right. So, Paul barely escapes this mob scene at Ephesus being warned by some influential people. They were complaining that he said that this goddess is no God and things that are made with hands are not gods and so on. Now he and his company are now on their way through Asia and Greece and have landed in Troas. They originally intended to set sail from Ephesus to Syria, but learned that the Jews were lying in wait for them verse number three of Acts 20, they then altered their route to return through Macedonia and sailed from Philippi instead. Look, the pursuer is now being pursued. Verse number seven. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. And he continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sank down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, trouble not yourselves for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even until break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive again and were not a little comforted. Can you just imagine their joy? Can you imagine you at a church gathering and someone falls and kills themselves and everybody knows that person is dead and in swoops an apostle of Jesus Christ and the boy comes back to life, that would be a hallelujah good time. Verse 13, and we went before to ship and sail into Asos, there intending to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Asos, we took him in and came to Mytilene, and we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried in Trogilium. And the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hastened, if it were possible, for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. Okay. This episode was recorded after the writing of the first letter to Corinth. 1 Corinthians was written during Paul's travel, and it mentions the first day of the week, which he also mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and 1 regarding collection for the poor saints 
and stated that he had given this command to the churches throughout Galatia. We know that Christ rose, the Holy Spirit came, and the church was established all on the first day of the week. Here's proof that this was the common day of, Christ, of the Christian's worship. Now, after preaching until midnight and raising the young man who fell out of the window, Paul is leaving in an effort to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost. He knows there's going to be a large gathering of Jews who needed to hear the gospel. He grew up going to Jerusalem for, Pente for the Pentecost celebration. Now he's going there to preach. And we know that Paul greatly desired for the Jews to obey the gospel. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. But if they won't hear, he's going to the Gentiles. He's going to the Gentiles anyway, but he's going to the Jews first. We've seen that time after time in his travels, he first always stops at the synagogue. Verse 17, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they would come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Listen to Paul. Beaten, chased, stoned, in prison, verbally attacked, plots against his life, lies about his teaching. He says, none of these things move me. None of this has slowed him down. So now when we hear that the Holy Ghost tells him that bonds and afflictions await him, he won't fear them because he's overcome them before. Can't you just see the difference in Paul? Can't you just see through our study how he has grown? through these afflictions he had to had to deal with. One the question to you, do you have any victories or escapes in your past that will strengthen your faith? Has the Lord moved in and fixed the problem for you that'll make you rely on him a little bit more next time? I believe that our trials are designed to make us strong. His commitment to the cause of Christ is far above commendable. He doesn't settle for establishing a church in one area, but he commits to returning and strengthening them, writing letters to them, praying for them. He does this in the face of threats and abuse. He does this with the knowledge of impending danger as told to him by the Holy Spirit. He is committed. Also, he hears from Jesus when his courage fails. Paul is all in on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that we can be more all in. I don't imagine that we'll see the level of commitment that we saw from Paul the apostle. But I do know this, that now when I read his writings, when I hear him say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, I believe he's speaking from experience. When I hear him say, all things work together for good to them that love God and those who are called according to his purpose, I believe he's speaking from experience. 
Hopefully one day we'll learn how to let our experience speak for us. We hope this lesson has been encouraging and strengthening to you. Until next week, share these lessons. Share them with your friends and neighbors and loved ones. Tell them it won't take you long. If you got 25 minutes, you can learn something about what the Bible says. Till we meet again, prayer always is that you'll be careful and be prayerful. God bless you. Show me glory. Show me Child.